Hello there, I'm Fiona Apollo and I'm an artist. Tell me, how many of you have taken part in or applied to an art contest or a zine? It doesn't have to be one that you got money or a prize out of, it can just be for charity or just to show some appreciation for a fandom you like. Or it could just be for the fun of it. These kinds of community-based events can be fantastic for improving your skills, boosting your motivation and confidence, finding new friends, and it doesn't ever hurt to get something out of it if you're lucky enough, but with every good thing in the world, there will always be that small subset of parasites willing to try and take advantage. So let's talk about some ways that you can avoid being the sorry soul that got fleeced. Let's talk about organised art scams and how to not fall for them. Now, scamming someone in an art contest or collaborative project like a zine is a bit different to say someone scamming you with a commission, because when the focus is on only one person, if you know what to look for then it can be much easier to notice when something feels off. But with larger projects, because there aren't as many of those around and when they do pop up there tends to be a lot of excitement in the air because you're suddenly thrown in with a bunch of equally enthusiastic creators, that can allow for a lot of surprisingly shady things to fly under the radar. No one likes to find out that the piece they worked hard on was disqualified but then still used for promotional purposes because you signed away the rights to it, or that the person in charge of the money decided to take it all and peace out without a trace. Really doesn't feel good, does it? Well, let's look at some key factors that will hopefully help you feel better equipped to deal with or avoid these situations. And for those who are hoping to organise their own collaborative projects or contests, I hope you take what I discuss here on board to avoid any potential discrepancies. And of course, if you like this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. I do a bunch of art related things, one of which is an experimental short series focusing on creating a story called Mint and Friends featuring my characters, one of whom you can see right here on the left. I've already done several YouTube shorts for each character and will be making a dedicated video looking at this project's world building in June. June's video schedule is looking like an indulgent one, let me tell you that. So please check that out if you're interested. The playlist containing all the Mint and Friends videos so far will be linked below and at the end of the video. But anyway, let's jump in! So it's probably going to get a bit confusing if I keep switching between art contest, zine, collaborative project, yada yada yada, so I'm just going to use the word project as an umbrella term. And we're going to start with an extremely obvious one, and that is to read the rules. There's no nice way to say this, some of you just don't read what you sign. And for the small percentage who do this, I implore you to look over the T's and C's before pulling any shocked Pikachu faces when you end up consenting to something ludicrous. None of us like reading the boring fine print, but it's a necessary evil, okay? And this isn't even me heckling a bunch of teens online, I work an office job and no one reads things before agreeing to stuff, whether they're 18 or 85, it's ridiculous! For the rest of you, this point can be less to do with not bothering to read at all, and instead is possibly to do with coming across some wording or terminology that you're unfamiliar with or are struggling to understand. There may be some of you who are dyslexic, or maybe just don't know what certain terms mean, and that's no one's fault. Not everyone is taught how to properly look into things such as signed agreements, because otherwise how would capitalism trap us into doing things? Is that a bit too real? If this is the case, the best solution is to just get a second pair of eyes to read it over for you. It's never a bad thing to ask for help, and there is no such thing as a stupid question. However, if these terms and conditions are so wordy that even people who are pretty good readers are having trouble, that can be a big red flag. Oftentimes this is a trick used whereby you will be presented with a contract, and this contract will have a lot of very intricately worded sentences that aren't used or understood by the general public. A lot of the time it is presented and waved off as what we would call legal jargon, you know, the kind of manner of speaking used in a court setting, a lot of places use this kind of dialect to invoke a sense of authority. This is all well and fair enough if you're engaging in something quite substantial. Say, a non-disclosure agreement in tandem with a large-scale collaboration that is offering a mutual compensatory benefit, better known as freelancing. It's that easy to have flowery wording mask what you're actually saying. And this is why we need to read things slowly and carefully, taking in as many of the terms used as possible, because those terms are often chosen very carefully as well. For an online art contest that more than likely will have a lot of younger people joining on impulse because they're eager to do something relating to their interests, any contest I've seen that has a lengthy wall of rules has always been one I've been decidedly wary of, because it kind of gives off that air of, let's cover our butts in every possible way so that we can do whatever we want. That's not to say say rules are bad, we do need them, but I can't help but wonder what these people are trying to protect themselves from if it's only supposed to be for something small and casual. It is much better to be clear cut and precise about what you're proposing, otherwise you'll have people like me becoming suspicious. Trying to use fancy words can make things sound a bit more official, but it can also confuse people depending on who it's
it's aimed at. Younger artists, for example, aren't going to put as much stock into what they're signing if it's just for a fun contest, and this can end up with them signing up to things that they would otherwise advocate against, and this is where dangers can arise such as art theft. Or rather, it would be art theft if you hadn't just signed your rights away to that drawing. So keep your eyes peeled. Even when you think you know the ins and outs of these kinds of rules, even if you've entered these kinds of projects a million times, you never know if someone might try to throw something sneaky into the mix and con you out of ownership of your own works. So it always pays to read things through. So this was never something I really thought of until my partner mentioned it, who does quite a few zines themselves, but a very important thing to make note of in any kind of project, especially one where money is involved, is to check that you trust the people who are organising it, look at how many people are involved, and try to gauge what their relationship is like with each other. The biggest one that I've started to take note of is to never join a contest with less than three main organisers running it, or if only one person is in charge of the treasury, aka the finances, because if only one person has access to that, then it becomes increasingly easy for that person to just disappear with all the profits, never to be seen again, and this ends up making the others involved appear untrustworthy as well. If a team is too small, they run the risk of not only becoming overwhelmed and having the project implode on itself, but it can also run the risk of that small set of people having ulterior motives, and a moderately sized group of organisers means more whistleblowers should things begin to appear fishy. So obviously this can be a bit tricky because on the one hand you can have a couple of friends who are really passionate about a certain fandom or a cause for example, and they want to organise a project in order to raise awareness and maybe donate the profits to a charity. It's a really sweet and noble thing to do, but on the other hand, if the two friends are organising a project together, there is always that small chance that they are both in on the same con, or one person can manipulate the other into letting them get away with things that they shouldn't. Now I'm not saying don't work with your friends, because that would make me a hypocrite, but there is always that chance of you both having different ideas on how to approach something, which can then lead to a debate, which can then lead to an argument, which can then lead to you getting mad at each other, which can then lead to the project falling apart if things start to spiral out of control and you just can't cooperate. A lot of friends can also end up being worried about this happening and go in the opposite direction of going along with someone's ideas that may potentially be unrealistic, and then the project can fail in that way too when things start to get too big for your boots. It is almost always a good idea to bring in someone who is a neutral party, someone who preferably has some experience helping to execute a successful project, and can act as a line of contact between the organisers and the participants. This not only helps the organisers to not run away with their ideas and keep themselves in check, but also helps to maintain a line of communication for the participants while the main organisers are trying to get other things done so that they're not also constantly doing things like answering questions. It's also not a bad idea to bring in people as interns or moderators, say if you have a Discord, who maybe want to learn to organise their own projects as well, because then you get more hands on deck, as well as a fresh perspective from someone outside of your executive bubble. And of course, make sure that more than one person has the power to take the reins should the situation call for it. If one of the head organisers gets sick or is kicked off for whatever reason, this is why you need more than one person to have access to certain things such as contact information or finances. It can be hard to hear someone potentially being brutally honest or challenging your vision for your own project, but if you want it to be successful, then you need to have your feet on the ground and be prepared to be receptive, transparent, and above all, organised. The participants and the people you have basically employed, because let's face it, some of these projects can more or less be seen as a part-time or voluntary gig, need to know that you can be trusted above everything else. So this point ties in with the one before in that it's a good idea to have a direct line of communication between organisers and participants, but what's also important is how they communicate with you. This of course depends on what type of project it is, but a lot of them will create their own discords or group spaces so that everyone involved has a place to mingle and keep updated on what's happening. A lot of the time this is done for security purposes, since a lot of zines, for example, urge you not to share what you've been working on, because then people might not pay for the zine itself if they've already seen the piece they wanted for free, which is understandable. This of course isn't always the case though, and for art contests, they can more or less be relegated to a public social media that periodically lets people know the status of the project, and then communicate with participants via email or DMs. 
and they're usually quite eager to help if you have any queries or concerns. But a big red flag when it comes to this is if there is little to no communication at all, or if they take a significant amount of time to respond to you, and people are left wondering what's happening behind the scenes. This can be a sign of many things, and may not always be a sign of ill intent. If this is their first time manning a project, for example, it could be due to workload, complications, issues with people causing trouble, or other such general chaos. But even with all of those in mind, people who are running these things should still be able to behave professionally and with good intentions, and they need to treat the participants with respect and courtesy. One thing to potentially look out for is exactly how professional they seem when speaking with people. I'm going to use the drama that happened with an art contest surrounding the VTuber Sadaway as an example. So there was a lot happening with that, so this is the streamlined version. For one, they did that trick where they included in the rules that Sadaway could still use any artwork submitted for her merch, regardless of if the works were a winning piece or were disqualified, which in itself is already shady as hell to me. The second issue is the way in which the mods handled the concerns of a participant who felt they were disqualified unfairly. The mods decided to tear the piece apart, accuse them of tracing, and then mock them. And this only got worse when Sadaway also encouraged the behaviour by more or less digging herself into a hole. Do I think Sadaway scammed these people? Not particularly, because I'm assuming that someone did in fact win the $5,000 that she was offering, but this is a tactic used by many scammers who may not actually have any prize, and instead now have a ton of merch that they can sell for their own gain, and then once they get hold of it, their real intentions become even more obvious. And as well as that, the way that Sadaway and her mods spoke to these people as if they were disposable and not worth their time can also be applied to how many of these scammers behave as well. So yeah, if someone is being short, rude, or takes an exceptionally long time to get back to you, which is particularly of concern if they are posting publicly as normal, these can be telltale signs of someone treating a project as a content creating operation, rather than as a fun event that is meant to bring a community together. Some people might be able to charm you with their words or demeanour, but there will always be things that give the game away. You just need to know what you're looking for. Alright, I think I'm done. Thank you so much for watching, and if you like this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. I just want to note that I'm not like a connoisseur of these kinds of things, I just have a bit of age and experience on my side. Take what I've said in this video with a grain of salt, as at the end of the day, you need to be able to trust your own judgement. Even if you do end up falling for one of these, it becomes a learning experience, and it will always be something to look back on for the next time. And with that, I will bid you adieu for now. Stay safe everyone. Bye!